thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the organizers for inviting me. Yes, it's, uh, uh, it's my first time at this institute in Vienna, but uh, the building is nice, the neighborhood, the whole city. It's a great place. I'm very glad that I'm here. Uh, yes, so I'll be uh, speaking about uh, geometric inequalities in uh, space of non-positive curvature. And uh, so this is the uh, rough plan uh, of these talks. Uh, the first two talks uh, will be devoted mostly to the isoparametric problem and related problem of uh, total curvature and a uh, comparison theorem by myself and uh, Joel Spruck, which has some applications in this area. Uh, it's proved uh, using a couple of different methods. One of them is a churn type differential forms that I uh, discuss. A related problem here is the Minkowski problem for uh, minimizing a total mean curvature in carton hazmat spaces, a harmonic mean curvature flow. I will also mention that in relationship to these problems. Uh, then uh, lectures uh, three and four uh, will be on convexity and rigidity of hypersurfaces in carton hazmat spaces. Uh, in particular, it leads to a solution to a problem of Gromov from 1985 on surfaces with uh, minimize uh, their uh, total absolute curvature. And then uh, these are the lectures also uh, get into some techniques from CAT case spaces, uh, including Grashedniak's uh, majorization theorem, Kurt Vaughan's extension theorem, and also generalization of uh, Scherz comparison theorem to spaces of non-positive curvature. Uh, I've already uh, posted these talks uh, on my uh, website. Uh, if you just Google my last name, my page comes up and there's a link to the talks. So uh, every, the first two talks are this, they're already posted. The next two talks will be this one. Uh, the papers I'm going to talk about, they're also all uh, on my uh, website. So there are uh, six papers there. The papers on my website are listed uh, chronologically. So these are papers since uh, 2022. On, this topic. Uh, the first four are with uh, Joel Sprock. Uh, this one is on this chain differential forms that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the last one is uh, based on an outline by uh, Anton uh, Petrone. Uh, yes. And there are uh, general sources, uh, general background, uh, manifolds of non positive curvature. There is this book, 1985 book by Bauman, Gromov. Show there. Uh, there's another uh, very well known book on metric spaces of non positive curvature or cat zero spaces by Britson and Heftiger. Uh, an excellent and very recent book on Alexander of Geometry Foundations by Alexander Kapovich and Petronin is available on the archive. Uh, there's this book, Isoparametric Inequality and Romanian Manifolds, again quite recent by Ritore, just uh, published. And this book, Tubes by Gray proves the Steiner formula in uh, Riemannian manifolds. Uh, so these are the general sources. And uh, right, so the iPad makes it convenient for me, but I stroll a lot. But as I said, uh, these talks are already on my website. So if you open them on your laptop and your iPad, uh, if I scroll too fast, you can always uh, backtrack. Uh, OK. so. Let me start with the first talk. Yes. OK, so everything I'll be talking about uh, will uh, have to take place in uh, carton the uh, space. carton hadamard space is a complete, simply connected Riemannian manifold with uh, non-positive curvature. Uh, later on, uh, I will also say some things that more generally hold in uh, cat zero spaces. Uh, so examples are the Euclidean space and the hyperbolic uh, space. Uh, Euclidean space that uh, Andreas Bernick was talking about earlier, and the hyperbolic space was also mentioned by Andre Seppi. So carton hadamard spaces are generalization of these two spaces. So uh, the talks for today seem to be uh, uh, well arranged. Yes. Yes, yes, uh, non-positive sectional uh, curvature, yes. Um, 
So examples are Euclidean spaces and um, hyperbolic space. Uh, so what are the basic properties? By the cartan hadman theorem, a cartan hadman manifold is always diffeomorphic to Euclidean space because the exponential map gives you a diffeomorphism. So uh, you take a point on your manifold, you look at the tangent space. Look at all the various directions that you have. Extend the geodesic from this direction, and this gives you a global diffeomorphism between your tangent space and your manifold. Uh, it follows that every pair of points can be joined by a unique geodesic. And also it turns out that cartan hadron manifolds are so-called CAD0 spaces, which was mentioned earlier today. So this stands for cartan alexandrov Toponogov, the name that uh, Romov gave them. And zero here means that the curvature is bounded above by zero. So CAD0 spaces are geodesic metric spaces where triangles are thinner than those in Rn. So a geodesic metric space is a metric space where every two points can be connected by a curve whose length is equal to the distance between those two points. And a thinner was already uh, mentioned earlier. Remember, thinner means that uh, if you take three points on your manifold, and then it's a geodesic metric space, so you can connect them with this curve. Or actually, it doesn't matter. Uh, Yes, it's a geodesic metric space. So the triangle does exist, and then you compare it with the triangle with the same side lengths in uh, Euclidean space. And thinner means that whenever you take two points here and compare the distance with two points here, uh, the distance here are always uh, smaller. So this gives a very nice way to think about curvature without having to uh, involve um, Riemann's uh, tensor. A lot of things in Alexander of geometry just follow from a triangle comparison. Uh, another way to think of uh, non-positive curvature is that the so-called uh, exponential map is uh, expansive. So what does this mean? Take a point on your manifold, take a pair of geodesics that come out of it, and take two points x and y on these geodesics, and for some uh, scalar lambda, look at the points lambda x and lambda y whose uh, distance from this point is this lambda x and lambda y. A non-positive curvature means that uh, this scaling is uh, sublinear. So if you were in Euclidean space, uh, you would have equality. But inequality in this direction makes the curvature uh, non-positive. So this is, again, another very nice synthetic way uh, to think about non-positive curvature. So, uh, so now it turns out that if you have a sphere and you scale it by lambda, then the uh, area of the sphere changes uh, according to this formula because you change the lengths by factor lambda. So if you have a manifold of dimension n, uh, the areas uh, scale by lambda to n minus 1. So, yes. Sorry? Uh, yes, I guess uh, lambda is uh, smaller than one. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, actually, that's right. So, so this property actually characterizes a uh, non-positive curvature. Non, uh, non, uh, this uh, expansive. Uh huh. Uh, the sphere. Uh, I'm not sure about that one. I mean, this one follows from the other one, but but the first one is certainly equivalent. Sorry. Uh, might be it's weaker, yes. But certainly the first one is equivalent. Uh, so using this now, you can show that the balls in cartan hadron manifold satisfy the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. So what does this mean? It means that uh, take a ball in your cartan hadron space, and then you compare it to a ball in Euclidean space, which has the same area. So if you compare it to a ball with the same area in the Euclidean space, then uh, what happens is that uh, uh, the volume here will be smaller than the volume here. So uh, you get the biggest volume always when you're in Euclidean space for a given surface area. So what this, so the idea is that the Euclidean isochromatic inequality also holds in general cartan hadron manifold, and um, I'm going to prove it for balls at least. So the way you prove it for balls 
uh, is by uh, looking at uh, the level sets. So we have the distance function from the boundary and look at this uh, level set at distance t from the boundary, okay? So I'm giving, a, uh, I'm giving a sphere S of radius R and M, and I want to compare it with a sphere S tilde in Euclidean space uh, of the same area. So the areas are the same. I want to uh, compare the volumes. So one way you can do that is by comparing the level sets. Uh, now, it's an easy exercise to check that uh, if S tilde and S have the same area, then R tilde, this radius must be bigger than this one. So now let's compute uh, uh, ST, this area, right? So if the distance here is T, this is same as uh, scaling by R minus T over R, by this sublinear property that I told you, uh, you get this inequality, okay? But the R is less than tilde R, so you can change that to R tilde. And then here you have this equality because this is a Euclidean space, right? So uh, in Euclidean space, when things uh, scale, you get this equality. And uh, this is exactly uh, S tilde of T. So, so we've shown that all the level sets here have a smaller area than the level sets here. So then uh, you can just uh, integrate now. Uh, by the uh, co-area formula, the volume of the ball is just the integral over all these level sets, but we showed that each level set is smaller than this, so we get the uh, desired uh, inequality between the volumes. So here's a good exercise now. Uh, why wouldn't this proof work for... Uh, convex bodies, right? So I proved the isomorphic inequality for balls. Uh, this proof that I just wrote, what would go wrong if you try to do it just for a uh, convex body as opposed to a uh, sphere? Where did we use the fact that this was, uh, these things were spheres? Exactly, the first line, uh, the thing is that when you have a sphere and you move in by distance t, it's same as uh, scaling. But for a general convex body, it wouldn't work. So in fact, this is, a, yes? Yes, uh, you can uh, still uh, rescale from the center because uh, the spheres are image under the exponential map of a sphere in the tangent space. So you can still scale in that sense. You just uh, scale the, it has a well-defined center. So you just scale with respect to that center. Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, uh, I guess, yes, I guess that's right. Normal coordinates, yes. Uh, so this is an open question, generalizing this to uh, convex bodies. Uh, the isopermic inequality for convex bodies in a cartan hardware manifold is a major open problem, even though, as you see, for the sphere, uh, it works so well. Okay, uh, yes, so this is the famous cartan hadamar conjecture proposed uh, by several people more or less around the same time, starting with Oban in 1960s, Gromov, Furago, Zagaler, that the Euclidean isopermic inequality should hold in uh, cartan hadamard manifolds. So if you have a domain in your cartan hadamard manifold, uh, you have this hypersurface gamma bounding a region omega, and then you compare it to a ball, a ball of the same area. We want to show that uh, this volume is less than the volume of the ball. Okay? Major open problem in uh, Riemannian geometry. Uh, it's known in uh, certain cases, uh, it's known in a hyperbolic space, and that's uh, not really so much harder than the Euclidean space, follows from Steiner symmetrization that I mentioned. N equals 2 was uh, established by Underway in 1920s. In fact, uh, this was Underway's uh, very first paper when he was a student of uh, Adamar. For N equals 2, it follows quickly from uh, Riemann's mapping theorem. Any disk, you can conformally parameterize it. And when you write down the um, 
formula for area in terms of the conformal factor and you just use the Stokes theorem, it uh, quickly pops up. For n equals three was proved by uh, Kleiner using the method of isoparametric profile then that later uh, Joe Sprock and I uh, studied extensively in the first paper that I uh, listed. Uh, n equals four, it was proved a completely different way based on an inequality of Santa law that somehow is uh, sharp in dimension four. This approach seems to be very much uh, dimension dependent, but uh, Kleiner's approach, which I'm going to mention, is seems to be a good candidate that might work in all dimensions. It's known for large volumes when the curvature is strictly negative, and this also has a quick argument, was observed in the paper of Yao, is also in the book of Burago Zagala on geometric inequalities. For small volumes, it's also true, although this paper of Johnson and Morgan is uh, quite long. Uh, Somehow there's a lot of details involved just to verify that. Uh, for every n, uh, there is some constant uh, for which the isoparametric inequality holds. Uh, this was this follows from a paper of uh, Sprock and Hoffman. So in every general, uh, in every dimension, it holds in some uh, a weaker inequality holds. And the isoparametric inequality, this cartan hardwell conjecture is uh, if the isoparametric inequality holds, then we also uh, we obtain this uh, Sobolev inequality, and this is equivalent. If this uh, Sobolev inequality holds in a uh, manifold, then the isoparametric inequality holds, and the proof of the equivalence is easy. Just uh, follows by applying the Poirier formula to the distance function. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, it's even uh, open uh, for uh, convex bodies, right? So why? Well. So this one theme of the first lecture is that convexity is not so convenient when you don't have a linear uh, structure. A lot of things in convexity that we take for granted just go out of the window. Okay, so let me start by a couple of proofs of the classical isoper isoparametric inequality. As I said, uh, one way is this famous Steiner symmetrization. If you take a hyperplane in Euclidean space, then you can look at all the lines that are orthogonal to it, and these uh, vibrate uh, any region that you have then you can uh, locate the midpoints of these line segments and move them down. So you can make uh, your region uh, symmetric with respect to any given hyperplane and by Cavalieri's principle, it uh, preserves volume but an easy computation using the formula for the surface area, you know, using the norm of the gradient. Uh, using that formula, uh, you can quickly show that the area goes down. So this shows that the um, minimizer, if it exists, which we know it does exist by flash case selection principle. It must be symmetric with respect to all hyperplanes and therefore uh, be a sphere. Uh, the neatest proof of the Braun Minkowski inequality in Euclidean, uh, of isoparametric inequality in Euclidean space is by Braun Minkowski inequality. So this is a Minkowski sum, which was uh, earlier uh, mentioned earlier. If you have two subsets of Euclidean space, uh, you can think of these points as vectors and add the vectors to get the summation. And this is the Braun Minkowski inequality. Uh, proving this uh, is very uh, easy. If you have a rectangle, once you prove it for a rectangle, then it follows from uh, any region by approximation. So, this is something that can be proven in one page. Uh, so, once, once we have this, then we can define the so called outer parallel bodies. Again, uh, this was also already mentioned earlier that uh, you add a ball of certain radius. But you know, this also makes sense in actually in any metric space. You can always look at a set of points within a distance r. Uh, so now we can uh, compute. So this is variational argument. How does the volume change? By the brown minkowski it's bounded below by this. Then by the binomial theorem, you get this. And the surface area is the first uh, variation of volume, uh, which uh, quickly gives you this inequality which is exactly the isoparametric inequality. Okay, so convexity in cartan hardwell manifolds, right? Convexity is always such a nice thing to have, but uh, in a Riemannian manifold in general, it's not as convenient as in Euclidean space. There are certain things that are uh, similar to Euclidean space. A distance function from a convex set is a convex function. This is true in Euclidean space. It remains true in any Cartan-Hadmar manifold. 
So a function on a manifold is convex if it's convex when restricted to each geodesic. Okay, so the definition of uh, convex function uh, follows easily. I guess actually, I guess I didn't define what a convex set is in a cartan hadron manifold, but remember in a cartan hadron manifold, the geodesics between every pair of points is unique. So a set is convex if it contains a geodesic between every pair of points. Uh, also, convex sets have uh, dimension. Uh, that is, uh, the relative interior is a totally geodesic submanifold. This is uh, one of the things proved in the book of uh, Chiger even. There are uh, important differences to Euclidean space. So just right off the bat, so if you take two points and you take the convex hull, you get the geodesic. So, so far, so good. The next step, take three points and take the convex hull, and then all of a sudden, you get something with interior points. So there is no simplicial structure for the uh, convex hull of uh, points in a Riemannian manifold. Sign distance function from the boundary of a convex body might not be convex in the interior. So sign distance function is that you look at the distance function from the boundary, but you multiply it by minus one when you're inside the region. In Euclidean space, it's convex outside, it's convex inside. In a cartan hadron manifold, it's only convex outside, not inside. And this by itself causes a lot of issues. Uh, the boundary of the convex hull of a set may not contain any geodesic segment. So that's, that's particularly crazy. Uh, because, you know, in Euclidean space, the boundary of the convex hull of a set, on any point of the boundary of the convex hull, which is not on the original set, through that point, there passes a line segment. But, uh, Sorry? Yeah, I guess a finite set, or let's just make it compact. Uh, this is a recent paper by Lichek and Petronen, and they actually go through a number of results, which are all kind of uh, very weird compared to uh, Euclidean space. Uh, then another thing that happens is that uh, you know, another, another reason that the convexity is so useful is because uh, one can look at it from so many different viewpoints in Euclidean space, and, you know, they all describe the same thing. But in a uh, Riemannian manifold, even in a cartan hadron manifold, these notions that are equivalent in Euclidean space diverge from each other. So in particular, there are three things that are equivalent in Euclidean space. So convex, you know, this just means that the set contains the geodesic between every pair of points. Then let's say it's called, let's say it's deconvex if the distance function from the boundary is convex inside the set. And let's say it's h convex if through each boundary point there passes a horosphere. So horospheres are generalizations of uh, tangent planes, uh, of planes in a Euclidean space. In a Cartan Hadron manifold, we don't have planes. But if you take a point and then you take a direction, then you can look at this geodesic. And then from these points here, you can uh, draw these uh, spheres centered at these points. The limit as this point goes to infinity uh, gives you a so-called horosphere, which is the closest thing that we have to a hyperplane in a cartan hadomar uh, manifold. So in Euclidean space, all these things are the same, but uh, they diverge from each other in a cartan hadron space. Uh, still more strange things happen, but uh, so some examples that illustrate why these things are not the same uh, can already be observed even in the hyperbolic plane. So this is the Poincare disk model, and this is two geodesics. So look at the region between two geodesics. It's convex, but not deconvex. The distance function from the boundary turns out to be not convex. Here, we take a geodesic, so this is a geodesic going through the center, and then this uh, illustrates a uh, cube of constant distance from the central geodesic. And uh, so this cube, it's a level set of the distance function from this geodesic. The distance function is always uh, convex outside the set, so this is a convex set, but it's not h-convex. You cannot uh, draw a horosphere through points on the boundary of this. Okay, so these are all bad news, uh, but maybe we can switch now to some good news, something that we can do. 
So how are we going to study the isophermetric problem in a cotton hat mode manifold? Well, we can adopt a variational approach, right? If you want to do analysis, you always have to do some kind of variation. Uh, in the sense of Steiner, uh, and this leads to integrals of generalized mean curvature. So these are the uh, so-called intrinsic volumes, which Andreas Bernig mentioned earlier. Sometimes they're also called per mass integrals or mixed volumes. I guess if you're in Euclidean space, then you have a convex body. Uh, then we can study to what extent uh, various so-called Alexandra potential type inequalities hold. So let me start by uh, reviewing the situation in Euclidean space. Uh, the Steiner polynomial mean curvature integrals, uh, Alexandra of uh, potential inequality. Uh, sorry, when did I start? How much time do we have? Oh, I can't go until quarter past? No, no. <laughs> 12? Five past. Okay, very good. Okay, very good. Uh, <clears throat> yes. So, Steiner polynomial. Uh, well, how does mean curvature enter the picture? So, suppose I have a smooth closed embedded hypersurface in Euclidean space, and uh, then it has these unit normals. So, if this is gamma, then uh, look at this uh, unit normals, nu, and then uh, one can go a distance, e times nu. So you obtain uh, this parallel surface, gamma plus uh, uh, t nu. And uh, so the Steiner polynomial, again to repeat what was mentioned earlier, says that the, uh, well, I guess actually earlier uh, formula for the volume was mentioned. This is a corresponding formula for surface area. If you um, differentiate the formula for the volume, you get the, the surf this one for surface area. So the surface area is the original surface area plus uh, this coefficients times uh, t. You get some polynomial of degree n minus one. For, so for the volume, you get a polynomial of degree n. For the surface area, you get something of uh, degree n minus one. So if you integrate this formula, then I guess you should get the, the ones uh, that mentioned earlier for the volume. Uh, so these C's, these are absolute constants, but these M's are uh, more meaningful. So this one is so-called total first mean curvature. The last one is the total gas Kronecker curvature. These are the so-called generalized mean curvatures. Um, so these are defined by, uh, each mean curvature is defined by uh, integrating a symmetric function of the principal curvature. So principal curvature, well, so this uh, normal vector field here, if you have a normal vector field, uh, we can uh, translate because we're in uh, Euclidean space. Uh, and so this is an important point because later on I illustrate why this fails uh, in a Riemannian manifold. But in Euclidean space, we have the uh, uh, Gauss map. So this new, we can uh, think of it as a map from gamma to Sn. So if you have, uh, if I have a point here, I can uh, uh, compute the differential. This goes from uh, Tp gamma to T uh, corresponding tangent plane of the sphere. This is always going to be parallel uh, to Tp gamma. So this is an operator on the uh, tangent space known as the shape operator. And the principal curvatures uh, are eigenvalues of uh, the shape operator. So uh, these are eigenvalues, but of course, once we have the eigenvalues, then all the principal, uh, all the elementary symmetric functions of the eigenvalues become uh, meaningful. They uh, they range from the determinant to the trace. Uh, the zeroth one, by convention, we said equal to one. So you integrate one, you get the area. So the zeroth generalized mean curvature uh, is just the area. So 
uh, as was mentioned earlier, one way to prove uh, the Steiner formula in Euclidean space is by polyhedral approximation. Um, in differential geometry, though, we can do it uh, faster. Uh, so this is for, so look at this, uh, the function that sends x to x plus tv, then you compute the differential, you get the identity plus t times the shape operator, and kappa i are the eigenvalues of that. Now the area is, uh, by the area formula, is just the integral of the determinant of the f, which is determinant of i plus t dv, and what is this? This is the characteristic polynomial of the shape operator. So uh, this is the differential geometric proof of uh, Steiner's formula. It's just as it's just algebra, uh, linear algebra, uh, 101. Uh, there's another way to um, think about these uh, total mean curvatures using Crofton's formula. So if gamma, which works uh, if gamma is uh, convex. So uh, this is a more geometric interpretation. I guess so what we do is that uh, for the rth one, we have to project the hypersurface into a subspace given by the Grassmannian, a, a subspace of a certain dimension. So we project in every direction into that subspace of the given dimension, and then we integrate and normalize. So this is average size of projections of gamma into subspaces of uh, this dimension. Uh, Mn minus two is known as the mean width. If you work out the dimensions, and you think about it, it becomes obvious why that's called the uh, mean width. And uh, the minus one, Again, by, con uh, by convention, it's just said to be omega. Uh, so one nice thing that happens, which is so important and useful in Euclidean geometry, is that uh, uh, the, uh, the Crofton's formula immediately gives us this monotonicity. So if you have a convex surface nested inside another, then we have this uh, inequality. The ones that are inside have smaller total mean curvatures. Uh, Alexander Fenchel inequalities say that if you take the ratio of these total mean curvatures to certain powers and you compare them to the corresponding quantities for a sphere of the same area, you always get this uh, inequality. And uh, these Alexander Fenchel inequalities are very useful. Uh, they include the uh, isoparametric inequality. So for k equals zero, they give you that. Uh, for k equals one, they give us the Minkowski inequality. So the Minkowski inequality, uh, what it comes down to is that among convex hypersurfaces with the same area sphere and only sphere minimizes the total first mean curvature. Of course, first mean curvature uh, the trace of the shape operator sometimes is just called mean curvature. So in particular for n equals three, we have this famous formula obtained by Minkowski that the total mean curvature is always bounded below by square root of 16 pi times the area of gamma. And then for k equals n minus one, we get the Gauss-Kronecker uh, curvature inequality. So the gas corner is what? The, the gas corner curvature is the product of all the eigenvalues of the shape operator. So for a surface in a Euclidean space, it's just called gas curvature. Gas corner curvature is just the determinant of the shape operator that uh, usually the term gas corner curvature is used to denote that uh, this is an extrinsic curvature. Uh, okay, so. For k equals n minus one, the alexander fenchel inequalities tell us that the total gas Kronecker curvature is bigger than the area of the sphere. Uh, but of course, this is so trivial in Euclidean space because uh, uh, the gas Kronecker curvature is just the determinant of the shape operator. But the uh, new if you have a convex 
surface, and then you translate all these uh, vectors to the origin, uh, the map is onto. So you integrate the determinant of that. That should be at least um, the sphere. So this last case of the Alexander Fincher equality is really trivial. The reason I'm emphasizing it is because in a minute you're going to see that uh, uh, this is an open problem in a carton hazmat manifold. So just showing that uh, the total gas quantum curvature is bigger than the volume of the sphere is a major problem. Uh, but it's still an important one. So if one can uh, establish the analog of this result in a carton hazmat manifold, then the uh, carton hazmat conjecture for the isopermetic inequality follows. Which is, which is kind of crazy, because, <clears throat> right? See, why, why doesn't this thing work in uh, general Riemannian manifold? Uh, the reason is that in a general Riemannian manifold, we don't have a Gauss map. Of course, in a carton hadron manifold, the geodesics are unique. So you can't just take a random point, and then uh, for any point on your surface, connect that point to your surface using the unique geodesic, and parallel translate along that geodesic. So you can define a Gauss map in that sense. But uh, this formula doesn't hold anymore. When you translate, the volume of uh, this mapping changes depending on the geometry. So uh, yeah, so the absence of the Gauss map is a big problem. There's another notion of the Gauss map that one can use in the carton hazmat manifold. From this point, you can extend this geodesic all the way until it hits the sphere at infinity. So that's another way of thinking of the Gauss map, but again, it doesn't satisfy uh, this property. Okay, so, uh, so this was just a review of uh, Euclidean space, but what about the carton hadron manifolds? Well, one good thing is that the Steiner polynomial still holds in the carton hadron manifolds, however, you no longer have an equality you're going to have an uh, inequality. But, but you know, at least you get the lower bound, which is nice to have. The alexander fenton inequalities have been extended to the hyperbolic space using the harmonic mean curvature flow, but not always in their sharpest form. So there's a series of papers by Ben Andrews and a number of uh, co-authors, although these other authors sometimes also have papers on their own that uh, the main method that they use is this harmonic mean curvature flow that I will mention, and then they establish some kind of monotonicity. They show that, so this harmonic mean curvature flow, the nice property that it has, if you take any convex surface in a carton hazmat manifold, it evolves it uh, to a sphere. And uh, so they show that uh, these total mean curvatures, not all of them, some of them, some of them behave monotonically. So because they behave monotonically, and you know that uh, the inequality holds for the sphere, then you obtain it in uh, general. Uh, the sharp minkowski inequality is not even known in uh, H3. So uh, the subset of the, the subject of my talks is carton hadamard spaces, but in some cases, the question is not even known in a hyperbolic space. So Yes, so this was, uh, so in Euclidean space was that uh, total mean curvature is bounded below by the square root of 16 pi times the area of gamma, which geometrically means that if you have a convex surface and you compare it with a sphere uh, of the same area, it always has bigger mean curvature. So among surfaces of the same area, the total mean curvature is minimized by the sphere. You want to establish the same thing in H3, and that's not... Uh, no. Well, actually, um, you see shortly. Actually, actually, it's known. It's known that the minimizer in H3 is not no longer even the sphere. But you still want to have a sharp inequality. What is the minimum total mean curvature among all surfaces with the same uh, area? Uh, okay. Almost all fundamental questions are open in cartan hadmar manifolds. Okay. So as you may tell, uh, this talk. Well, I guess the, the talk is, me, uh, is meant to be an advertisement for carton hazmat manifolds. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting problems here. 
And uh, well, I certainly appreciate all the help I can get. I think there's a lot of good problems. Um, also, I don't want to discourage by saying that. Well, the, the problems are difficult, but I mean, I showed you a lot of papers, so I think uh, uh, there's opportunity to do a lot of work. OK, so isoparametric inequality is open. Carton Hardmuth conjecture. Gas Kronecker inequality is open. So this is uh, this one, that the total gas Kronecker curvature is bigger than the area of the sphere. Um, so now this is, this is really embarrassing. Uh, forget uh, bounding it below by the area of the sphere. Just show it's bigger than epsilon. Show it's bigger than one billion. Uh, even that uh, hasn't been established. Uh, although I think if you can find some uniform constant, that already I think would be very good and may actually lead to the actual thing. So it's not a, so even for uh, I think uniform constant, it's not a trivial case. Uh, so Minkowski uh, inequality. Sorry. Yes, yes. For which one? For which one? Uh, no. So even in four, it's open. So in dimension, in dimension three, it's very easy. In dimension three, it just follows from the gauss bonnet theorem and Gauss's equation. So in dimension three, it's trivial. But even in dimension four, it's open. Which is strange because in dimension four the isoparametric inequality is known. Croak uh, uh, proved that. So, so, so actually, so, so actually, in some way, uh, well, I mean, you know, this is actually this is a deeper problem because it implies the isoparametric inequality. So maybe it's not uh, surprising that it's not even known in dimension four where the isoparametric inequality is known. Okay, so in a, I mean, Kafka inequality is open, uh, but actually for k less than or equal to zero. It was solved recently in one of the papers with uh, Guan uh, with uh, with uh, Proc using harmonic mean curvature flow. It turns out it was just a computation that we did, and then we solved that. But uh, you know, but this doesn't take care of the hyperbolic space. Okay, for hyperbolic space, a has to be non-zero. Okay. So uh, okay, so the gauss conker curvature implies the isomorphic inequality via this method of Kleiner. Uh, Kleiner's paper in uh, Invenciones is uh, quite short and uh, goes through everything uh, quickly. In my first paper with uh, Brooke, uh, we, studies, we studied this implication in uh, great detail. So it follows from the, using the isoparametric profile to, and taking the derivative of the isoparametric profile, but we don't have time to go into. Um, but a more recent discovery is that the Minkowski inequality, if you can find the optimal inequality for the total mean curvature, that also implies the isoparametric inequality, at least when your region is uh, deconvex. Uh, that's uh, in, in, in another of the papers that I showed you. Okay. Okay, so, so that was some good news. Now, again, back to uh, bad news. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, so more uh, strange convex uh, convexity phenomena in carton hadmont manifold. Monotonicity. So remember, in uh, Euclidean space, we had the monotonicity formulas uh, by Crofton, right? Because these were, uh, you were projecting into some uh, subspace and you were integrating over that. And if something is contained inside some other thing, when you project it into a subspace, then it, it's, it remains smaller. But the monotonicity formula fails. Or, uh, so MN minus one, this is, this is the gauss kronecker curvature. This is the product of all eigenvalues. And this example was uh, discovered in 1981 by Dexter, was a Russian mathematician working in California in General of Differential Geometry. I mean, you think this is a well-known journal, which it is, but uh, uh, the first time this result was cited was in my uh, 2022 paper with uh, Joel Sprung. Somehow hasn't been cited earlier. Nevertheless, uh, the example is actually quite devastating. So he takes um, three dimensional carton hadron manifold by taking the uh, hyperbolic plane and crosses it with R, but it's, it's a warp product. 
So when he crosses it with R, he also scales the metric. Okay? So it's not just a product, but it's a so-called warp product. And so I've drawn a disk here, but this disk uh, uh, represents a pancake. So this is the surface. This is the kind of a, uh, you just, uh, you know, you just look at the pancake, which is constant distance from this disk, and you look at the surface of that, okay? So this is a pancake, and he compares that pancake with this cone. Uh, so this lies inside this. However, uh, its total gas conflict curvature is going to be bigger. So, I mean, uh, it's pretty devastating because, uh, uh, right, so, so why is this bad? Uh, so the reason that uh, this is bad is because uh, if you want to prove the total, um, if you want to prove the gas Kronecker curvature inequality, uh, one basic idea, right, so, so you have this surf surface, and I can assume it's convex. And so you want to show that its total gas Kronecker curvature is bigger than the area of the sphere of the same dimension. Well, one way one could try to do it is that if you can deform it continuously by going inside until it becomes round or very small. Or one of apples are locally Euclidean, so if you have a, a small enough sphere, uh, it satisfies the total uh, gas corner cur curvature inequality. So if you can do this in a monotonic way, right, then uh, the gas corner curvature uh, inequality will be proved. So Dexter example shows that uh, if, if this method is viable, then this deformation is not arbitrary. Just constructing a sequence of nested surfaces is not going to reduce the total curvature, but that deformation itself uh, will be quite subtle. Okay, so more strange phenomena. So strange phenomena also happens even in H3. Even, you know, just regular hyperbolic space, you, you, you think that it shouldn't be so strange as a carton hardman manifold, but this example was uh, uh, established by Navera and Solanes. Uh, I think they were students of Santalo, one of them. So Santalo uh, studied the inequal geometry, many notable things that he discovered, and he was interested in Minkowski problem. Uh, minimizing total mean curvature in uh, H3. And uh, this pancake uh, beats the sphere, okay? If you take a uh, disk in H2, a subset of H3, and just thicken it a little bit, uh, it's more efficient than uh, here. It has uh, less total mean curvature than the sphere of the same area. Uh, okay, so I guess last, I'm, I'm, uh, you said five minutes after, yes? Okay, very good. So. This was the last thing I want to going to mention. Uh, so Minkowski inequality implies the isoperimetric inequality. So this also uses the co-area formula that I had uh, mentioned earlier, right? If you want to study the volume of some region, then you can fibrate it into level sets, mm -hmm. and then you integrate these areas. But also something that's important there is the gradient of the function which generates that vibration. In the earlier case, I use the distance function. If you use the distance function, the gradient is gradient as a norm one. So it, it doesn't appear in the formula. Okay, so suppose that Minkowski inequality holds at least for these deconvex hypersurfaces. So if the distance function from the boundary is convex, it means that you can fibrate uh, your region by these convex sets, even though they may not always uh, all be smooth. So suppose that uh, we have this inequality. That is whenever I have some hypersurface, with the same uh, area as a sphere in Rn, then its total mean curvature is bigger. Uh, and equality holds only when gamma is itself a Euclidean ball. Then the isoperimetric inequality holds for, uh, as I said, for these deconvex surfaces. And uh, this is a relatively simple argument. Uh, it involves, uh, I'll tell you the basic ingredients of the proof. It uses the notion of reach in the sense of Federer. So reach of a convex hypersurface in a carton hardman manifold is proved, uh, defined the same way as in Euclidean space. Uh, you can think of it as the supremum radii of balls, which uh, roll freely inside gamma. So roll freely means that, so we have some R, 
at each point on the boundary, you can construct the sphere of radius r, which lies uh, completely inside. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in a sphere, uh, or actually in a general manifold, reach can be defined as the distance between the boundary of your regions and the so-called cut locus. Uh, the cut locus, these are the singularities of the distance function. If you have an ellipse, uh, the distance function is going to be uh, smooth in the complement of this uh, line segment. So this is another way to uh, define the reach. Uh, the reach will always be positive as long as the surface is uh, C11. Okay, so, and then uh, inner and outer parallel hypersurfaces. So the, again, a basic observation is that uh, let gamma minus t be the inner surface at distance c, gamma t be the outer one at distance t. So these are two basic facts. If you go inside by a distance less than reach and you come back, you coincide with the initial object. But if you go in further than the reach so that you develop singularities, then you come back by the same distance, then the area will be uh, strictly less. And finally, we have the co-area formula that uh, one can compute the volume by integrating over the level sets if the gradient of your function is one. Okay, so you put these things together, and uh, you know I don't have time to do too much justice uh, to this proof, but as I said, these are all uh, online, so very quickly, let this be a sphere in Rn with the same surface area, then you can quickly show that the in radius here must be less than the corresponding radius. So we know that our spherical inequality holds for uh, spheres, uh, suppose that gamma uh, is not a sphere. So suppose it's, uh, then its total mean curvature will be uh, bigger. Uh, so it means that for small t, these level sets will be smaller in area than these level sets because the first mean curvature, remember, by the Steiner's formula is just the variation of area. So if the total mean curvature is less than this, when you go inside by a small distance t, uh, these level sets, you can compare uh, the... Uh, their, um, their areas. So if the areas are all less for all t as you exhaust your region, then co-area formula finishes the proof. So suppose, suppose that you know, the level sets are not always smaller. At some point, the level sets get bigger. Then you can um, go back up again. How far can you go while maintaining this inequality? The supremum of that, at that point, you must have some equality. So sorry, I'm going to a little quick now, but as I said, this is all uh, in line. So then you get this inequality, which means that you can go all the way back to the beginning while maintaining this inequality. Then you just, and then you show that this leads to a contradiction. There are two cases, either uh, the first time when this inequality occurred, the strict inequality, T0 was less than reach of gamma, bigger or T0 less, and then this is a really, really simple computation. I mean, I don't have time to go through it, but it's really uh, all there. So this gives you a quick, quick way to do it than the paper. And uh, okay, so actually that's where I was uh, planning to stop. Uh, so next time I will start with this uh, comparison formula, which uh, this formula here, which tells us if you have a pair of nested hypersurfaces, how can one uh, compute? the difference between the total uh, mean uh, curvature, and it involves the Riemann tensor and the principal curvatures and the gradient of the fibrating function. Okay, thank you.